Stephen, I want to key off of some comments you made earlier uh, around the kind of human dynamics of board, CEO, CFO. Um, they're wanting to achieve an attractive strike price vis-a-vis -vis the 409A in the recruiting of, of new employees. And so sometimes when a growth stage company encounters uh, scenarios to um, provide secondary uh, uh, sales of, of existing stock, they might hesitate or worry about the impact on the 409A. So a secondary being um, allowing an existing shareholder, a preferred shareholder, a common shareholder to sell their stock to a, to a third party. Uh, rather than a new issuance, issuance of, of preferred stock. So um, here's the scenario. It's one year after uh, the last preferred round of uh, financing for that company. And the company um, is allowing a one-time sale by a founder or a couple of executives to sell some of their common stock to a third party. And the company will provide uh, information on the company to the third party uh, buyer. Um, is that something that um, a CEO and CFO can proceed with with confidence or are there certain things about the impacts on the 409A that they should be mindful of? Sure, and, and with, with respect to, to secondaries, I think uh, because of all the considerations that you just mentioned, it's, it's good to be uh, intentionally planning ahead for uh, you know your secondaries, who's going to participate, how frequent, um, you know, and uh, the amount that potentially would be involved, because all of these have uh, ultimately uh, some influence uh, over the valuation. And by far, I'd say that the, the most commonplace secondary that we typically see in early stage companies is one where it's a founder liquidity type of event or one where it's the founder and a few key employees who um, are provide some measure of, of liquidity. Uh, now, on one hand, you mentioned that in terms of information, um, essentially there's access to information. So from a due diligence purpose and from a pricing perspective, um, you know, the price for the secondary wasn't set in a vacuum. However, um, the, really the kind of the key consideration in, um, uh, for this situation and for others is thinking about um, the, the, the participants, the sellers in this case, in the secondary. And, um, you know, as a general rule of thumb, as you expand your circle of participants, um, the, the more weight uh, typically is given to that secondary. Uh, the other thing to consider is that for the founder uh, or for those employees, it may be a situation where it really is not uh, reproducible. And so when we think about uh, transactions that are taking place, um, uh, there's consideration given to who's participating, but also how reproducible are these transactions? Is it something that's specifically um, structured for the founder and um, is, are there any other plans to repeat that transaction to a broader uh, group of employees? And, and oftentimes what we find is that for that first secondary transaction um, that is really targeted towards just a few people uh, and really is not reproducible, that um, it is setting um, a starting point for the secondary uh, transaction in terms of, of perhaps what you're planning down the road, um, but frequently does not have a, a direct bearing on the 490 valuation.